Our text of Scripture today comes to us from 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 15. We are going to read all the way down to 2, 3. I'm sorry, 16. 2 Peter 1, 16, right on down to 2, 3. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. You may be seated. Father, as we come into your presence uh, this morning, we acknowledge uh, your sovereignty uh, over our lives. We acknowledge that you are the one who has revealed truth to us, and we are to live by it and according to it. Uh, In many ways, we fail to do this. I pray, Lord, today that you would help us to be attentive to your truth, to learn from it, and to learn how we can better serve you and better apply your truth to our lives, especially when being confronted uh, in a world filled with many false teachings. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Not long ago, I went down to my office uh, in the basement, and uh, there was water all over my desk, all over the floor, uh, all over the wall, and I was just befuddled by this. Uh, I couldn't figure out what happened, so immediately I started looking for the source of the water, obviously. Uh, I thought maybe a pipe had broke or something, but I couldn't find anything. And then I realized that there were a couple bottles of water on my desk with the caps off, and they were pretty much empty from what I remembered. So I figured maybe my kids came into the room and had a party, you know, and squeezed the bottles of water all over the place. Uh, But that did not explain why the ceiling tiles were saturated and the water on the floor just along uh, the wall, uh, the, the water was on the floor just along the wall. And then I remembered that Uh, I was out front uh, just prior to that running the faucet uh, out front, and I hadn't run it since the winter before. So probably what happened is I left the hose on at some point, and it froze the pipe, and it busted. Uh, Rookie mistake. Later on, we ran that pipe again, and we found that the water was indeed coming from that pipe. So we found the source of the problem, and we called somebody to come in and, and fix it for us. And as uh, we're going to see in our text today, God has determined truth, and he gives us truth, and he has given us a source for that truth in order that we might know truth. And so for us to find truth and to know truth for certain, we must go to that source that God has given us to find it. So I want to look at that today from two different uh, perspectives. The first is that God has revealed truth, so we must go back to the sources to know truth. We must go back to the sources to know truth. And number two is God is revealing false teaching 
So we must examine the root and the fruit to know the truth. We must examine the root and the fruit to know uh, the truth. So we see that first point uh, back in verses 16 through 21. Let me go ahead and, and read that again and we'll get to work. Okay, so 2 Peter 1, 16, for we did not allow cleverly devised, uh, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So you will remember last time we, we were together, uh, the week before last, Peter spoke about the importance of cultivating godliness in the Christian life. And at the end of that passage, he talked about uh, the fact that he knew he was going to die soon, and so he wanted to make sure that the Christian church understood these most important truths that he was going to lay out. And so today, Peter is continuing that conversation by telling the church some of the things that he thinks are most pertinent. And you will remember, Peter had a real concern about false teachers in the church. He had a real concern about false teachers. And so today, he is going to give us some clear and obvious ways in which we can identify false teachers and false teaching in the church, specifically false teachers, and that is by their teaching and their life. Their teaching and their life. In other words, you recognize them uh, by the things that they say and the things that they do. The things they say and the things they do. So first, the things that they say. What does Peter say? We didn't follow cleverly devised myths, which tells us that false teachers are not giving you an accurate uh, description of the facts, right? They're not giving you the real skinny, as it were. Uh, they're not giving you the gospel. They're giving you something that they've conjured up on their own. False teachers give, uh, give you man-made philosophy. It is made up, which is very different from what Peter and the apostles did. What Peter does here is effectively tells us is that uh, we, what he and the other prophets have done is, bas is, is told us what God has said. That's what he and the other prophets do. They tell us what God has uh, said. Uh, he, he says that there are two sources effectively uh, to this truth or to this witness that he and the other prophets uh, bear witness to. And that is the eyewitness accounts of himself and the other apostles and the Holy Scriptures. In other words, he gives us the Old and New Testaments as sources. He gives us the Old and New Testaments as sources. He first mentions the time when uh, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain, and he, uh, God the Father said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him, which they did. And after Jesus died and was resurrected, they went around uh, preaching about who Jesus was and what he had done. And the things that they said, the witness of himself and the other apostles, were eventually written down in the pages of what we call the New Testament today. Okay? So the New Testament scripture. Uh, further, he says, we have the prophetic word, which is more fully confirmed. And this is a reference to the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament had already been written down at this point, and the Jews of uh, Peter's day would have trusted it. And he says we have the prophetic word, which is more fully uh, confirmed. Now, Peter goes on to tell uh, to, to say why the scriptures can be 
uh, trusted. And what he is going to say here about the Old Testament scriptures could be applied to the New Testament scriptures as well because they are both inspired by God. So how do we know that the things that the writers of scripture say are true? Well, this is how. They didn't conjure them up on their own. They got them from God. Look at what he says there in verses 20 and 21. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Um, He says the Scriptures, the truth of God's Word, does not come about by one's own private interpretation. Okay, In other words, people don't look around at the world and reason within themselves and then turn around and declare the infallible truth of God's word. It just doesn't work that way. Okay, In order to get the infallible truth of God's word down onto a piece of paper or into somebody's mouth, God must superintend the process, which is exactly what Peter says God did with respect to biblical prophecy And the Holy Scriptures. Men spoke from God. He says. Men spoke from God. As they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And and that phrase to be carried along in the Scripture. Is used to refer to a boat. Being carried along through the water. By the wind. This is what happens when God inspires Scripture. Peter says. Men spoke. Men spoke. That is, they write when they do write down the things later on. They use their minds. They use their vocabulary. They use their wherewithal. But they spoke from God, is what Peter says, and they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, God is the one who did the driving. God is the one behind these men who are writing and who are speaking doing the driving. God superintended the process in such a way so that when the men were finished writing, the things that they wrote down on the piece of paper were the very words of God. God made sure the things that they wrote down on the paper, he made sure nothing got down on the paper that he didn't want down there on the paper. Does that make sense? That's what we're saying here uh, when we're talking about uh, uh, the writing uh, of Holy Scripture and, and biblical prophecy. So how do you know if the things that somebody is saying are false? How do you know? Do you just guess? Do you base it on your own opinion? Do you base it upon which way the wind is blowing that day? No, you must know the truth in order to compare it to what is false, right? For instance, if you work down there at the bank, Uh, you see $100 bills all the time on a regular basis. You handle $100 bills. You smell $100 bills. You see $100 bills. And so if somebody puts a fake $100 bill into your hand, you are going to know the difference between what is true and what is false. And it is the same with Holy Scripture. We must handle the Holy Scripture. We must see the Holy Scripture. We must learn the Holy Scripture. You must be in the Holy Scripture. That way, when we are confronted with a lie that goes contrary to Holy Scripture, we will immediately know the difference. It's as Peter says here, we must go back to the source of truth. We must go back to the source of truth. Uh, There was a rallying cry in the Reformation to go back to the original sources. Uh, The phrase in the Latin is ad fontes, which is back to the sources. And this word fontes is where we get our word fountain and font. And what are fountains and fonts? They are the places from where the water comes, just as the scriptures are the place from where the truth comes. So again, we must know the scriptures. We must learn the scriptures. We must imbibe the scriptures, the scriptures must become a part of us so that when we are confronted with false teaching and lies from false teaching, we will know it in a moment. How do you know if what somebody is saying to you is true? How do you know if it's godly? How do you know if it's good? 
How do you know if it's biblical? Do you take what they say to be biblical just because they say it's in the Bible? Or do you take what they say to be good and right and true just because they say that they are a Christian? No, you have to know what the Bible says. You have to know what the Bible teaches in order to recognize false teaching, right? One of the greatest problems in our day, the source of all of our problems, if you will, is biblical illiteracy. It's biblical illiteracy. Um, and I'm right there on board with you. Uh, I don't know the scriptures the way that I should. We don't know the scriptures as a people the way that we should. Not the way that we used to, anyway. Uh, recently, Ligonier Ministries down in Florida did a poll uh, on... Uh, on Christians, on evangelicals, and just other people in general to see what they believed about the Bible. And Ligonier Ministries does this poll every other year. And I put a post up on Facebook uh, the other day with some of these stats, and I couldn't find those exact facts. I couldn't reconcile them with what was being said on Ligonier. So I went back and I did the research myself, and I want to share with you what I found. Okay, so this is, this is people who claim to be evangelical. They claim to be Bible-believing Christians. This is what they said. 30%, and I have a slide here for it, 30% say Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 30% of people who claim to be Christian, who claim to be evangelical, who claim to be the Bible, uh, Bible believers, they say Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. 48%, and by the way, a lot of these numbers are better than they used to be. They were worse uh, uh, in years past. 48% uh, say the Bible is not literally true. Not literally true, which militates against everything that Peter is telling us today here in our text. That's what our message is about. This is truth. But 48%, that's almost half, say that the Bible is not literally true. 58% say that religious belief is a matter of personal opinion and it's not based on objective truth. Uh, in other words, it's my opinion versus your opinion. It's not, it's not hard facts. It's not hard objective truth revealed to us from God. Okay, This is Bible-believing Christians again. 17% uh, say that science disproves the Bible. 46% of Christians say that people are generally good. That denies the doctrine of original sin. 42% say that God, and this is almost half again, 42% say that God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. So according to 42% of supposed evangelical Christians, Muslims and Jews who reject Jesus as the Messiah are going to be in heaven with us one day. And this one is staggering, 22% say that gender is choice and not biological. <clears throat> gender is not what you're born with, it's what you choose to be, right? <clears throat> now let me tell you something, friends. If you claim to be a Christian and this is what you believe, you've been duped, okay? This is false teaching. But how can this be, right? 30% of people who claim to be Bible-believing Christians say that Jesus is not God, <laughs> That, that was settled in the very beginning of the church. That was a debate that happened early on, and Christians for ages have believed that Jesus is God because that is what the Bible teaches. But yet, we still don't know the Scriptures, we still don't know the Bible, and many people still don't know God. <clears throat> this is because we don't know the truth. Uh, people are listening to false teachers day in and day out, and taking what they say to be gospel truth. There are supposedly over 200 million Christians in the United States of America. And let me tell you something, friends. If there were really, if all these people who claim to be Christian, over 200 million were actually Christian, then this land would look like a very different place. So we must be on guard. Uh, we, no, we must be able to discern the truth from error. Error. We must go back to the original sources. That's the only way that we will be able to do that. Uh, during the time of the Reformation, the Bible had not been translated into all the different languages 
like it is today. So it was very easy for the Catholic Church to keep the scriptures locked up and under key, right? But when the reformers learned the original languages and they went back to the original sources and they learned that what the Catholic Church had been teaching them for years was lies, everything changed. There was another phrase in the Reformation and in the Latin, it is post tenebras lux. Post tenebras lux. After darkness, light. After darkness, light. The reason, friends, that the Middle Ages are referred to as, or, or excuse me, the Dark Ages are referred to as the Dark Ages is because the light of Holy Scripture was being kept hidden. But when the truth of God's Word was unleashed, light broke forth into the world again. We are living in a day, friends, when we have the Bible written in our language. We have many different Bibles of our own. Uh, you can have the Bible translated into pretty much any language in the civilized world. We have truth at our fingertips, but in many ways we are still very, very ignorant. And so what must we do? We must go back to the sources. We must learn truth. We must go back to the truth. And if we do, we will see light break forth once again, friends, in our families, in our homes, in our community, in this nation like never before. But we must go back to the sources. God has revealed truth, so we must go back to the sources to know truth. We see that second point, God is revealing false teaching, so we must examine the root and the fruit to know the truth in verses 1 through 3. Let's read that again. But false prophets are also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality. Because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. He says, false teachers arose among the people. Well, what people? The, the people in the Old Testament. And in the same way, he effectively says that they are going to arise among you as well. So is it safe to say that you don't have anything to worry about with respect to false teaching or false teachers just because you are in a church that claims to be Christian? No. Peter says they will arise among you. They will arise among you within the church. And how will you recognize them? Again, it is by the things they say and do. It is by the things they say and do. Do the words that they speak measure up with the standards that Peter has been giving us? Do the words that they speak line up with the Holy Scriptures, as they are found in the Old and New Testaments? Do their lives line up with the things that Peter has been telling us about a person who knows Jesus and lives according to the truth of Jesus as it is set forth in Holy Scripture? Peter says they deny the master who bought them. They deny the master who bought them. And the word here for master is despotes which is where we get our word despot, right? So that means Lord, right? That's the Lord. That's the sovereign. So even though they claim that Jesus is their Lord, they deny it again by the things that they say and the things they do. They do not teach the words of Jesus. They teach their own words. They do not follow the words of Jesus. They follow their own words. So you see, just claiming to know Jesus or invoking the name of Jesus or saying that you are saved by Jesus does not amount 
to knowing Jesus. Do you see that? Peter says they deny the master who bought them. They deny the master who bought them, and they do it in word and deed, I'm saying. Okay? And that could be true for every one of us. We can deny the master who bought us by the things we say and the things that we do. We talked about this in our Bible study this morning. Do our lives line up with the testimony that we have? Do our lives line up with uh, the truth of the gospel? Do the things that we say line up with the truth of the gospel? Do we live like we're actually forgiven people? People who have died with Jesus and been resurrected with Jesus. They deny the master who bought them. Specifically now in respect to these false teachers. They do it in word and deed. They do it in word and deed. So first in word, he says they secretly bring in destructive heresies. They secretly bring in destructive heresies. That is, they sneak things into their teaching that usurp the very authority by which they claim to teach. Because again, Jesus is Lord. He is the authority. And therefore, the things that we must, that we say, have to line up with what he has taught, right? If he's the authority. Um, and you may ask yourself, what did Jesus teach? Well, everything that you find in Holy Scripture, Jesus taught. The Bible affirms that Jesus inspired the writings of the Old and New Testaments. He is the one who is behind the revealed Word of God. He is the Word of God. But these men bring in destructive heresies. That is, their ideas uh, depart from the truth as it is found in Holy Scripture, which creates division in the church. Which, by the way, that is what heresy means. It means to divide. So it creates division within the church. So what a false teacher does is he repackages the truth of God's word with a bunch of lies. He sneaks a bunch of lies into it and he slaps the name of Jesus on the outside and he hands it over to you. See how that works? Very clever, right? But this is what the devil has been doing from the very beginning, friends. He takes the truth of God's word and he, he twists it and he uh, distorts it. The devil is not a creator, we must remember. He is a creation, and therefore the devil has to work with what he finds in creation. He has to work with the truth of God's word. And so what he does is he inspires false, teacher to, uh, false teachers to smuggle lies into the truth of God's word and then hand it over to you. <clears throat> he injects, uh, he inspires false teachers to inject lies into it, to twist it, to bend it. And when you believe one of these truths, it is destructive to your life every single time. It'll be destructive to your life now, and it will be destructive to your soul uh, in the very end. Finally, uh, they deny Christ in the things they do. So the things they say, and also in the things they do. Peter says many will follow them in their sensuality. That is in their licentiousness, their, their abandonment of biblical morality. Uh, these people are rotten down to the very core. They have corrupt hearts. And from time to time, this corruption will reveal itself. You will smell the stench of the corruption. Uh, false teachers uh, may look very good on the outside for a time. They could have perfect hair, you know, and a big smile with pearly white teeth. Uh, they can be very persuasive. They can create great followings for themselves. They can speak very authoritatively and convince you that the things that they are saying are right. They can have power and prestige, but underneath of it all, they are wicked at bottom. They are immoral, and it shows. And it may not happen all at once. There may be little things here and there that you notice. That it's just not right. It's just not right. And then, and then uh, eventually uh, they are found out. And you hear lurid details of how they've been living their lives. And the people who 
are closest to them and who follow them get carried away with them because they look at these false teachers and they think if it's all right for them to do it, then it must be all right for me to do it, right? And that is why false teaching is so destructive uh, to the church. They, false teachers lead you to believe things and to do things that will ultimately end in your ruin. So where do we see this sort of thing infiltrating the church today? <clears throat> Excuse me. Where do we see this sort of thing infiltrating the church today? Because the devil is still up to his same old tricks, right? He's still smuggling lies into the truth of God's word and giving it over to you. Well, here's an example. This is a statement that should not be controversial among Christians. Every Christian should be able to affirm this statement. Black lives matter. Right? Should not be controversial. But when you drill down into the ideology of the movement behind the people who have made that statement, you will find that it is not very Christian at all. As a matter of fact, uh, and, and just because... Uh, if you don't think that this stuff is infiltrating the church, it has, friends, and it is. Our old denomination, the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, is affirming the movement Black Lives Matter. So Black Lives Matter, right? God created every man in his image. No matter what your ethnic background is, no matter what your race is, you have inherent value, dignity, in worth in the eyes of God. So black lives matter, obviously. But what you find out is that along with the black lives movement, the black lives matter movement, you get all of this other teaching smuggled in. And I have some of the things that they believe here on a slide, and this is public information. If you go online and you look up black lives matter, this is their statement of faith. Just like Christians have a statement of faith, you can go there and you can pull it up right now and you'll see exactly what they believe. And this is just some of it. And it's absolutely damning. But I want you to see uh, what they believe. For instance, according to their own statement of faith, they do the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege. And if cisgender today means, you know, you believe that you're actually the gender that you were born with. So you're born as a male and you actually think you're a male. That's, that's cisgender. So they do the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women. Okay? In other words, they want to do away with the biblical categories of gender that God created. God created them male and female, and say what many evangelicals are saying today, which is gender is a choice. And if you're a Christian, you can't say that. You can't say gender is a choice if you're a Christian. We got to get that. God created them male and female. Male and female. <clears throat> um, another one. They seek to disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. They seek to disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. In other words, they want to do away with the traditional family that has a mother and a father in it. Uh, and they want to make the black community the father of these children. And by extension, it ends up being the government. And this is why our nation is in such shambles. You want to know what the problem is? It's fatherlessness in the homes. Fatherlessness is the problem. But they want to dismantle this, excuse me, disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. And again, this is abiblical. God designed the home to have a mother and a father within it. And God has given the government of the family, to the mother, and to the father. So again, an unbiblical idea. You cannot affirm this if you are a Christian. Further, they foster a queer-affirming network. Again, this is right off their website. Foster a queer-affirming network 
When we gather, we do so with the intentions of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking. That is the idea that you and I have, that men should be with women and women should be with men. Get rid of this heteronormative thinking. <clears throat> freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather, the belief that all in the world are heterosexual, unless she or he or they disclose otherwise. In other words, they want to seek to affirm and normalize these sexual relationships that God says are abominations. Men with men and women with women, they want to lift this up and they want to affirm it and honor it. And again, if you're a Christian, you can't do that. You can't do it. A man shall leave, a man shall leave his father and mother to be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You just can't do it if you're a Christian. Further, if you want to know whether a tree is good or bad, what do you do? You look at the fruit, right? You look at the fruit as we read this morning. So just look at the fruit that this movement, Black Lives Matter, has borne in America since its inception. Look at the riots and look at the uh, violent protests. Look at the buildings burned, right? And the beatings. These are all a result of this organization's ideology. This ideology drives these people. Zoe asked a profound question in Bible study. Why does the things that people believe cause them to do the sorts of stuff that they do? Well, our beliefs, our worldview controls the way that we think. It affects the things that we're doing with our hands. It affects the decisions that we make. It determines the things that we're willing to do. So what you believe matters. And that is what this group believes. And so what, what do you see? You look at the fruit of the movement. Yes, black lives matter, but apparently the people's lives who were destroyed, the black people's lives who were destroyed when those buildings and those businesses that they spent their whole lives building burnt to the ground, apparently those black lives didn't matter. Where was black lives matter then? The fruit, again, where's the fruit? Where is Black Lives Matter when these black children are being murdered day in and day out down there at the abortion mill? You don't see Black Lives Matter in front of the abortion mill. What about down there in the ghetto, you know, where gangbangers are shooting black men and women and children every single day? Where is Black Lives Matter? Again, the fruit. Apparently only some black lives matter. So again, the statement itself is good. It's true. Black lives matter. But what the enemy does, he smuggles all this other stuff in along with it. And that's what we need to be aware of. And we need to be aware of the fruit that this movement has borne. So if you want to know whether something is corrupt, if the root is corrupt, just go and look at the fruit. But even upon closer examination, if you look at the root itself, you will see that it too is diseased. So words and deeds, friends. Once again, words and deeds. The things that we say and the things that we do matter. We have to pay attention to the things that people are saying and the people that people are doing in order to spot false teaching. In order to recognize a false teaching teacher or false teaching when we see it or hear it so god is revealing false teaching so we must examine the root and the fruit to know the truth so we've seen that god has not kept us in the dark concerning truth but he has uh, revealed the source to us plainly everything that we need to know friends about what is right and what is good, and what is true. Everything that we need to know about life and faith is addressed in the pages of Holy Scripture. Further, we have seen that false teachers, they go against the grain of Holy Scripture, and their lives 
do not line up with the things that we see being taught in Holy Scripture. So let us be the kind of people that know truth, friends, who can discern truth, who live according to truth, and let us not be deceived by any group or any teaching that would seek to lead us away from the truth into believing things that would ultimately end in our destruction. Let us go back to the source, Holy Scripture. It is the only firm foundation of the Christian. Always was, always is, and always will be. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us plainly in Holy Scripture. We thank you that you've not left us in the dark. We thank you that you've given us a sure and steadfast word from heaven, a sure guide. Let us love your word. Let us imbibe your word. Let it become a part of us and let us live it out in our lives and judge. Amen. For the song of response, how firm a foundation.